Hey guys, how you doing? This is Augustus Dunbar, the hybrid entrepreneur, coming at you guys today. Uh, today, I'm super excited about this interview. I'm with my guy, Michael, uh, AKA Gypsy. He's gonna tell you a little more about himself. Uh, we met at a, uh, what was it, a networking event. That's right. In Frisco about a month about ago. About a month ago, give or take, And yeah. love this guy's energy, love what he was bringing to the table. And I said, as soon as I start doing these interviews, you gotta come on the show. Called him, he actually came out, gave me a hassle, I'm just kidding. Love <laughs> my, um, has a back, background in what? What would you say your, 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 your industry was? I know you're doing something different now. Right, yeah, so I have a background the last eight, 10 years. I've been focusing largely in sales, sales mm -hmm. marketing and sales training and recruiting. So okay. every aspect of the sales industry. Like <laughs> and so was it was it the last year the year before you did what two point six million in sales? Yeah, last year I did two point six million dollars in sales. Absolutely. And so what I would like to do is to bring you guys an example of success as an entrepreneur in business and kind of like just just learn from his uh, it, it stories and mistakes and things like that. So, Mike, before we jump into anything else, sure. you prefer Gypsy or Mike? Gypsy is fine. Gypsy. Yeah, <laughs> right. um, one, you know what? So I guess let's start there. What's the what's the how did that name? How did you get that nickname? You know, it is uh, nobody ever gives themselves their own, own nickname. So I was a freshman in college and I was at a small Catholic school. There was seven other Michaels in my grade because it's a small Catholic school and uh, there's one Michael allowed, one Mike allowed and everyone else went by their last name or their nickname. <laughs> and I was fighting to be the Michael of the my grade group but uh, we were watching, of all movies, Borat and yeah. in the movie Borat they have a whole bunch of uh, Scenes That's a comedy, they, right? Yeah, it's a comedy okay, show. Yeah, 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 it's a comedy movie, and then uh, Sasha Cohen, yeah. um, and they they have scenes in Romanian, but they put English translations on the bottom that mm -hmm. don't correspond with the language. And so I start translating for my friends, like, we're a gypsy. I'm like, I'm not a gypsy, I'm Romanian, there's a difference. And it's like, yeah. no, you're a gypsy. And I couldn't shake it, so I took it and I branded it. So I always tell people, you know, when they ask me, you know, why do they call you a gypsy? I say, I'll steal your heart, not your wallet. So I <laughs> do remember you said that. This That's guy right. has a lot of cheesy sayings too. Really good, really good. Very easy to break the ice with and everything. So tell us a little about your story. Like, like growing up, where you're from, were you in entrepreneurship, or were you in sales at right. a young age, or what, how was that happening? Yeah, so I'm a DFW native. My parents uh, defected from communist Romania in, mm. uh, in 1987. Uh, so they actually swam across the Danube River. So you're first First generation, generation okay, that's right. Gotcha. Yeah. So they crossed the river, they actually got in jail, they got jailed in Yugoslavia, that's where they spent their one year anniversary. Wow. Uh, and they found out they were pregnant while they were in jail. Wow. So, uh, and it was about like, you know, a 33% chance that they're gonna be sent back. So mm -hmm. it was a huge risk to them, but they defected, came to the United States, and I was born in 88 here in DFW. Growing up was always a loud mouth kid, always had way too much energy. Um, but then it wasn't until college that I really learned how to do sales until I joined the sales corporation and that taught me everything I know now, how to build proper rapport, how to actually engage people the right way, um, and actually how to speak with purpose because I used to not speak with purpose, I'd, tack, or I'd talk on and on for no good reason and uh, people would be, uh, you know, annoyed by me, I would say, yeah. uh, so I wanted to make sure that I provided uh, the sales company actually got me to be approachable. Mm -hmm. So uh, so when I was in college though, uh, my first year in college, I was young and dumb, lost my scholarship my first year. Were you, were you a pretty good student in high school, like A's and B's? What was your um, I was actually a B's and C's kid. Okay. Um, I got a couple A's here and there, mm -hmm. but uh, I was mostly a B's and C's guy. Even the blind uh, score finds in the day once in a while. Huh? Yeah, and I actually got, <laughs> I got a crazy, uh, I had a crazy high SAT and mm. um, uh, I don't know if I should say this on camera, maybe we can cut this out later, but I had a perfect 36 on my ACT, mm -hmm. uh, even though I never took it. Uh, the college board made a mistake and gave me a perfect score, so I got <laughs> full ride to universities all around <laughs> the United States, so I was wow. lucky. So I got wow. a really good scholarship at my school, it was, they paid for 80% of everything, so wow. the rest of it I could pay myself. But I lost my scholarship my first year. Wait, so the, the, the test that we're going to keep it now. Yeah, so yeah. you got the, the, the excellent score, you got this great 80% ride, and then right. you lost it. And then I lost it my wow. first year. All yeah. right, then. So, uh, super exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you lost it going into the second year? Yeah, going Did into you the lose second going year. Going into the second semester. Losing in second year. So they gave me, I was on probation for the second semester. So if you, if you don't clean up your act, we're gonna, we're gonna take your scholarship away. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got this. Mm -hmm. And I did not have it. Uh, so, uh, so second year, I took out a loan. Third year, I took out another loan. Yeah. Um, third year, I got freaked out because uh, now I'm $75,000 in debt. Mm. What um, school did you go to? Hogwarts? You know, I went to University of Dallas. So okay. yeah, small okay. little private liberal yes. arts school. 
So I was at 75 grand in debt in my third year and I already changed my degree for the third time. Uh, yeah, so a while ago. Were your parents? Yeah. You, you paid. Your parents were oh, yeah, paid. Paid. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, my parents were like, whatever you want to do, right? Just make sure it's something good. Uh, so, by my third year, I was pursuing my degrees in English, business, and industrial organizational psychology, which is okay. the idea of how does business interact with people and how do people interact with businesses. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, but my third year, I decided, okay, you know, I'm a telemarketer. That's what my first job was, by the way. I was an mm -hmm. appointment setter for realtors to do house appointments, and mm -hmm. then I worked in telemarketing for car dealerships. Mm -hmm. And so, that wasn't going to pay the my tuition and my debt at all mm -hmm. and it was giving me the experience I needed. So my third year, day one, I built a business plan. Day two of year three, I started to execute that business plan and by the last day of that third year, I sold that business and that, that sale provided me enough money to pay for the next year. The next year, I built a uh, day, day one of year four, I built a business plan. Day two, executed the business plan. Two weeks later, I sold it mm -hmm. to pay for the next year. And on year five, I mm -hmm. built a business plan, executed it the next day, and about two months after graduation of college, I actually uh, sold that business, and that actually paid for all my college debt. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So two questions. Mm -hmm. One, I want, I'm curious to know your adage, of, your your opinion of the old adage: go to school, get good grades, get a good job. Right. That's question one. And then question two is: you seem like you started off as like a rough child, like not the best grades, right. doing all, lost your scholarship, and you know. Uh, first, second year, right? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of somehow did like a 180 and now you're like selling businesses in two weeks and, and all these other things. Yeah. So speak on that, but first I want to know your opinion of the, that old adage. Yeah, so the old adage, you know, uh, get good grades, get a good job. Mm -hmm. um, there is truth in it, by the way. You know, there are people who get really good grades, they get good scholarships and they don't lose them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, <laughs> they ride that success and a scholarship really does help, you know, getting the good grades is a competitive advantage versus people who were like me who didn't try hard enough because in school I wasn't challenged enough by my teachers. Mm -hmm. In fact, my parents got pulled in um, because for it was my freshman year of high school and six of my seven teachers called a parent-teacher conference all at once with my parents, which is like the most wow. terrifying phone call yes. for a parent. Yes. I didn't learn this until about two years ago, by the way, yeah, so my okay, mom told okay. me about this. But uh, I had six of my teachers in front of my parents saying like, hey, your son is smart, your son knows what he's doing. Uh, we're just very concerned because he has, on average, based on all these classes, about 14 zeros on assignments, wow. right? And my parents are like, what do you mean? It's like, it's his homework, right? He mm -hmm. doesn't turn in his homework. And they're like, no, my son does his homework. They're like, no, we are aware of that. He does his homework. He just never turns it in. Mm. I was lazy, I, 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 yeah. I didn't care, I don't know what it was, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it was really funny because then the, the teacher, you know, my parents asked the teachers like, so what grade does he have in your class? Like, oh, he's got like an 87, no, he's got like a 95, he's got like, you know, 102. Ah, gotcha. And so my parents like, how, how is he having these high scores in your classes despite not turning in homework? He's like, well, he's really smart because he always does the extra credit and then all the extra projects. <laughs> so let me put it this way, because you yeah. kind of sound like me. So mm -hmm. it sounds like school was too easy for you. Yeah. You could put in minimal effort and still get decent grades right. versus someone else who had to try really hard and just kind of and whatever. that's and that's what screwed me in college okay you know what's so funny that's probably why we connect same thing here right right the only difference between me and you is that my dad had a very high standard yeah right because he so his thing was and hopefully well my parents are first generation immigrants okay super high standards right all so immigrants right? yeah oh absolutely yeah they they just hated that I was like failing failing college essentially was what okay. I mean. so same thing here same thing yeah. here so I understand you go to college you're like man this actually is hard I actually right. have to put in effort here and everything yeah. like that um, you have to actually turn in your assignments apparently <laughs> apparently that's something that I didn't they don't learn, just assign right? them to you <laughs> just exactly because right. yeah. okay okay and um, so the reason I asked that question about the old adage is because my dad and hopefully he doesn't watch the interview <laughs> went to college yeah. community college yeah. and what he told me you know what, he should have shared it with me, you know, shared it with people. So he slept with his teacher, mm -hmm. right? Got kicked out, he's like, of course, got kicked out. And so that was his big dream for me, was to go to college and finish and, and things like that. And not sleep with your teacher. Exactly, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and, um, and so I did that, found myself in corporate, uh, uh, all kind of student loan sure. debt, hated the job. And so right. I got to a point where I was like, you know what, I've done X, Y, and Z. I've got the good grades, good job. Mm -hmm. I did everything and I'm unfulfilled, unhappy. And Tony Robbins says the, the, the ultimate failure is doing what you're supposed to yeah. do just to get what you want and now you figure out that you don't want it anymore, right? right. Um, so now we talked about addicts. So 
tell me what happened. Like, how did you end up flipping it around? Or actually, you didn't. Flip, you, just, you 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 sound like a bad student the entire time, and right. then you just were great at business and sales. Right. Right. So tell me about more about that period right there where you're flipping businesses. Yeah. So when I was selling those businesses, right. So um, I was working in a sales company, um, and they gave me basic training. And I'll be honest, I, I did not expect to be in sales. Mm -hmm. um, my first goal was to be a doctor lawyer, like mm -hmm. both at the same time. Uh, <laughs> not recommended. I, I, I yeah, learned. Yeah, yeah. I, I learned. I didn't hate myself anymore. Yeah. Uh, and then I entered sales. Uh, and in reality, I got to the sale. I got laid off because I was working at um, call center for car dealerships. Like I said, and this was in 2009. Mm -hmm. Remember, in 2009, we had the giant, you know, auto, yes, uh, auto yes, industry yes. failure. So I got laid off, and then so. Uh, I wrote down on a piece of paper, and this is what I always do when I'm job hunting, right? I write down, like, this is my perfect job for me right now. And I said, I need a job that provides scholarship opportunity, I need a job that find, provides me flexibility, a job that has a high pay to uh, offset my hours from school, because mm. I was still pursuing, I only had two or three semesters in college where I had less than 18 credits. Wow. But on top of that, I was also the president of three clubs, part of the student government, and I was also a ballroom instructor for the school as so well. So, before I cut you yeah, off, yeah. Yeah. so, what I'm hearing, and I'm doing this for the listeners, is yeah. one, I've heard you say several times, you start at the beginning, you I, you write down what you want, yeah. right? Yeah. I feel like it's, it's important to highlight that because a lot of people figure out what they don't want and they just complain about it. Right. They never figure out what they want. And then two, it seems like you were very social. You you, yeah. you were well known by a lot of people. Would you say both those two things are yes, important? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I found the importance of actually writing down my vision yes. before I even learned why it's important, right? Okay. So, uh, in reality, for me, it was a God thing, right? I feel like, hey, you know, God provides if I go ahead and write down, mm -hmm. you know, these are my objectives, right? Pray about it, write it down, right? I have clarity. Yes. So that way, when an opportunity presents itself, I can actually look at this piece of paper and say to myself, hey, this opportunity matches the piece of paper. So instead of people saying, like, I think this might be a good opportunity, no, I literally have a piece of paper that physically shows me this is the opportunity I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, a few days later, come across a job interview that is in sales. Again, I wasn't expecting to be sales. Sales was not on the list. It was just, hey, I need these qualifications. It happened mm -hmm. to be a sales job. And I was bad. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I was an awkward kid. Like, I was not able to interact. With, like, if you, if you were a woman and this mm -hmm. close to me, I would not be able to interact with you mm -hmm. confidently, right? I was mm -hmm. the basement dwelling. Dungeons and Dragons, Magic All throughout high school and college and everything. Yeah, exactly. So right. how does that kid become the president of organizations and the ballroom dancing? How do you do that? So that was because of the sales job, right? Yeah. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah, so the sales job, uh, you know, I, when I got accepted for the interview, I was still hesitant about doing the training because never did sales before. I did telemarketing, which was not quite sales. It was more telesurveying. And so I approached my mom. Like, they said, listen, I was, my parents said, we were in a sales organization when we first came in. They worked for, um, uh, shoot, what's the, they sell a whole bunch of products, starts with an A. Amway? Amway, there you okay. go, it's perfect, right? So, so network marketing. So yeah, my, par my, love network yeah my parents did network marketing when they were yeah. younger. Um, uh, when they first moved to the States, they did Amway for a while. Uh, they were not very successful at it, but they learned a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So then my parents said to me, like, listen, I'm not saying you're gonna be in sales all your life, but you should give it six months, mm -hmm. right? And I got it during my winter break, so six months would be up to summer break. I thought to myself, if I do a sales job until the summer, summertime come around, I'll get some internships, then I'll get a real job, not a sales job. <laughs> um, and so in the training, like I said, I was really bad, I was really awkward, but the repetition of forcing myself into people's lives, interacting with them, getting her to know a lot, Yes was really good for me because I was always afraid of hearing the word no. So I was mm -hmm. very much a people pleaser. That's probably mm -hmm. why I was so awkward because I'd mm -hmm. always try to be positioning myself to be the person that people like so much. And mm -hmm. if you're the person who always tries to be likable, I guarantee you, you're not liked, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I was always trying to be like, well, I was afraid of the word no. This job taught me how to accept the word no. Uh, I actually think that it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it took me about four or five months before I got into my stride. Mm -hmm. But by then, while I was in my stride, I got two internships. So, mm. but I got the internships because I had the sales experience. Because these were fine. This was a finance internship mm -hmm. and then a sales internship. Yeah. So I kind of put my sales job on the side because it was so flexible. I could put it away. It was a direct sales job, and I did my two internships for about two, three months, and then I found out that internships don't pay anything. So I was broke. Uh, so, <laughs> so back to sales so, you went? So back to sales I went, mm -hmm. right? And then I, a spark of, ins 
inspiration hit me. I hit the guard, the ground running, and then I say, you know, there's. I was in a sales contest, a push period, and I always mm -hmm. tell my friends like, there's me before the push period and then after the push period because it was on my very last day of the contest. I was trying to sell ten thousand dollars of product. I was at mm -hmm. fourteen hundred dollars coming in. Mm -hmm. Two weeks coming by, and I had a twenty-two no's and only three yeses for fourteen hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And I told my boss like, there's no way. I'm gonna win this contest. There's mm -hmm. no way I'm selling 10 grand. And he's like, God, the universe, the spirit of your choice demands your success today. Go out there and do your best job. Mm -hmm. And then let everything else go free. And it was a crazy day, but I actually ended up selling over $9,000 in product on three appointments that day. Wow. And it gave me such confidence boost, right? And it's I realized- like, get out of my way. You right, can't tell right, me anything. Yeah, you right? can't tell me no anymore, right? Yeah. Like, you know, and then, uh, and then that's when I started my first business, actually. So that's when I, that was, bef that was the summer in between year two and year three. Mm -hmm. So year three, I come around, you know, I'm like, okay, I can build a business now with the confidence. That's when I became the president of, of all these clubs. Mm -hmm. That's when I actually started pursuing, you know, my social life. Uh, so and, you just turned into like the great Gatsby overnight. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, I became very social, very open. People were like magnetized to me. Yeah. Uh, because people told me no. I'm like, hey, dude, that's fine. High five. We can be friends later. I don't care, right? And move yeah. on to the next person. People are like, wait, why are you moving on to the next person? I'm like, because you don't want me. You can want me later, whatever. And yeah, yeah, it yeah. Became, made me more desirable over time, right? And I was running mm. my own business and I was hiring my friends for jobs that flowed mm -hmm. through my company and stuff like that. So that. I'll give the credit to that sales job, but the funny thing is, is that I quit that sales job for a year. Mm -hmm. Then I came back just for the summer times until I became a full-time manager, mm -hmm. and then I ran my first sales office two years, uh, two and a half years into like my career there. I moved to Oklahoma for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, Oklahoma is very different from DFW, by the way. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and I had my the first eight months of running my own office would probably be most trying and struggling times of my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, largely because the company wanted to shut me down several times, but I was not used to quitting yes. or someone telling me you can't do this anymore or I'm not allowing you to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'll kick it in gear for like a week. Yeah. And the company's like, okay, well you did good enough for this week that there's hope for us to keep you continuing. Mm -hmm. And I went back down again. Yeah. And then I'll kick it in for a week when I heard some one of my friends like had hey, the company yeah. is about to call you to shut you down. I'm like, okay, let's kick it in gear. Yeah. And then it'll die down again. And then <laughs> I kept doing that for eight months, which yeah. is doesn't provide a healthy lifestyle, yes. right? Uh um, stressed. I was stressed. Uh I was so poor that um I had to sleep in my office mm. because I couldn't afford to go home. I didn't have enough gas money to go home. Oh wow! I was like, "What do you mean?" Okay, you literally cannot I, I afford. Could, I could not afford, right? <laughs> um, I remember. I'm with you, not actually. Right? No, that's no, totally fine, right? Um, in fact, I needed to change a clothes, so I searched the entire office. I found ninety-two cents in change. Mm. Uh, drove my car to the nearest gas station, and I was like on E, like on the like you know the little bottom part of the the, the yes, gas thing, right? Yes. It was like on E. Go up there, I give the guy 92 cents, and this is when gas is like 2.95. Give him like 92 cents, I'm like, I would like this much money in gas. <laughs> and he's like, that won't get you any gas. I'm like, I know, but that's enough to get me home and back. Please give me 92 cents dollars worth, 92 cents worth of gas. Yeah. And he looked at me with such pity, he's like, dude, I'm gonna bump it up to 150. Yeah. Right. That afforded me two trips to go home. Right. So I actually got went home, showered, got a new outfit, got a couple new outfits, went back to the office. Um, that was one time. And then like two or three months later, um, I moved much closer to the office just in case things like this, so I could walk there. You've done a lot of talking. Yeah. Uh, gypsy, gypsy. I said, what's good? <laughs> so you've done a lot of talking. Um, so about the past, what are you currently doing now? So let's a bit more about that. Yeah. So what I do now is actually work as a performance-based business consultant. What that means is I work with small and medium-sized businesses help them grow, and if they don't grow, they actually don't pay me. So I'm, yeah, so I'm like a normal business consultant that says, hey, I'm gonna walk in, assess your business for a week to two weeks, you give me twenty to $200,000, and I'm gonna give you a stack of paper and wish you luck. What I do is actually work with businesses long term, for three to five years, help the business owner with the things they don't know they don't know, mm -hmm. help them with each step of the way mm -hmm. to actually grow their business. And the great thing is, is that's a low risk investment for my yes. clients because 
if they're not getting more money, well, they don't pay me any more money. So, mm -hmm. so that's what I'm doing right now. I like that. That's interesting. And so, is that a common thing that's going on in the industry right now, or is that more so innovative? So, for my organization, Team Up, it's a little bit more innovative. Uh, you see a few people in the industry doing it on the coast, so the East Coast, West Coast, mm -hmm. and there's a bigger organization in Australia that focuses mm -hmm. on that, and that's who we kind of mimic our model after, mm -hmm. uh, but we modify it for the American audience and things. So, mm -hmm. it's, a much, it's much more entrepreneurial system here in America, so that's why we have to modify a little bit towards the American entrepreneur. So, yes. so it's not common. I think maybe we're early part on the trend and I think it will become more common in time. Okay, awesome. And so, what you're doing right now, um, I'm sure you have like counterparts that are doing the same thing. And, and right. So tell me, what makes you more successful, right? Whether it's things that you're doing or mindset, how you think, what makes you more successful than your counterparts? Yeah, so uh, what makes me more successful, because we do have a few people on the team. I am the number one in my office. Mm -hmm. um, what makes me more successful is probably two things. Number one is that I, as a business consultant, advocate to other business owners to have a business plan. I myself have my own business plan as a consultant. Okay. So just because I'm not running my own brick and mortar business mm -hmm. or service size business, right? I'm still in that entrepreneur level, just like my business owners, and I have to approach them with the same way that I'm going to teach them. Mm -hmm. So I have my own business plan. So I know what are my measurable results. What am I looking to? And I actually know my numbers. So I know how many people I have to talk to to get a client. Mm. I know what I need to do with my client to get them to the next level of success, right? Mm -hmm. I also know how many events I have to go to to meet people. I also know how to ask for recommendations. So, because that's all written down in a master document, it's like, this is the process of my business. Gotcha. So you seem very strategic and everything. Mm -hmm. Tell me how the, the average person does it I mean, when it's not like that. Right, so um, so I come across salespeople all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I come across consultants, I come across realtors, people who are like, you know, independent, building their own business, yes. building their own book, uh, depending on the type of business. Um, the average person, I think, kind of wings it. They kind of approach things like, okay, business will come to me or I'll come to the business. And they're just like, if I get the business today, that's awesome. I'm going to get fed today, right? It's very fight or, flight or fight for them. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they don't have an actual idea of like, hey, what is the next step? They just know I'm supposed to get something, work on this business, chase after business again, and then work on it. They don't have a systematized process mm -hmm. that they can have multiple things going on at the same time because they haven't focused on the actual process of how things should be growing and how, actually how they should be getting their clientele or increase the revenue. I like it, I like it, I like it. So I know we've been talking to you for a while, right? Um, what I wanna do is wrap this up. Sure. Uh, we have to do a part two or something like that. You're yeah. very, very, very try, very easy guy to talk to, right? Sure. <laughs> um, I want for the last few minutes to, for you to look in the camera because there's a, a hopeful entrepreneur. There's somebody who's sitting at home, they, they have a nine to five, maybe they love it, maybe they hate it. They're looking for another way to create a source of income and they don't want to go get a part-time job. They've always wanted to run their own business. They've always wanted to be their own boss and they just never got started. They've always had excuses. They've always had, I don't know, a lack of support, whatever it is. What two or three tips could you give the listeners to help them out in that area? All right, so the three tips I can give to any entrepreneur or someone who's thinking to become their own entrepreneur. Number one, write it down. Uh, every time you have a new idea for a new business, write it down. If you're already part of an entrepreneurial endeavor, write down your process, write down your goals, write down your dreams, write down your target customers. Anything you can actually do about that business, just write it down. I have an idea book when I was in college. How did I actually get so many businesses and how do they grow so quickly? I wrote them down, wrote details, wrote bullet points. Did every idea become a business? No, it did not because some of the ideas were bad. But you know what, I write down the bad ideas so I can look at my good ideas. I'm like, that is better than that. And that is better than the other thing, right? So you wanna write down your business idea, your business plan, and how you're gonna actually approach it. Number two, surround yourself by the right people. Um, I always say that you should have three people in your life. One, you should have a mentor. You should have someone who's already done what you're doing or something similar to it so you can actually ask them questions from you so someone above you, right? So you always wanna create a relationship with someone that's a little bit more successful than you. If you can, someone who's a lot more successful than you if you have a chance. Uh, the number two person you should have is a peer. You should have someone who's on the same level as you to actually be able to exchange ideas on level playing fields so you can actually say, hey, you're having the same struggle as I'm having and I wanna make sure that, you know, if you're doing the same things I'm doing, I wanna make sure I can observe the mistakes and observe the successes so we can actually grow together because growing by yourself sucks. 
And lastly, what you should do, the last person in your relationship circle should be, is someone who's beneath you. You sh your yourself should be a mentor. If you have a mentor teaching you stuff, you should go ahead and mentor someone else who's actually struggling, and they probably look up to you because they think that you're more successful. It doesn't matter if you don't think you're successful, by the way. There's someone less successful, there's someone lower than where you are right now. I don't care what you're doing, and they need help to be elevated. Like I said, you should never do anything by yourself. The third tip I can give someone is read. And if you hate reading, listen. So you can get audio books. Uh, there's a ton of books I always recommend uh, to entrepreneurs. Uh, I listen to podcasts nonstop. Uh, I listen to probably about 14 podcasts a week. Uh, you know, and it's something that really gets me excited and motivated. Uh, if you give me the chance, I'd love to recommend two or three books real quick. The number one book I recommend is called The E-Myth. The letter E myth is about how do uh, how do entrepreneurs actually become entrepreneurs and why do they become entrepreneurs. The number two book I recommend is called Grit, uh, G R I T. Uh, what Grit's all about is actually how to go ahead and um, put your head down when things are going really really hard and actually uh, face your struggles and become stronger. And the number three book I'd recommend. Uh, for a little bit of fun is called Winning uh, with People by John C. Maxwell. People ask me, how am I so charming? How am I so engaging? That book I've read six or seven times. Uh, it is really in detail. It's got 21 laws of how to actually interact with people a little bit better. And if I can, my bonus book is uh, Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. That book made me the salesperson I am today. Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. It just makes you the ultimate look, sales I machine. Look, look, I gotta stop you, you yeah. way too much value. You're probably going for hundred books. Right. Where can they reach you? Where can they reach you? Yeah, they can reach me uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. You can search me by my name, Michael Velosin. Um, and you can find me on Instagram as well at Swing Fool. I love swing dancing. I'm a fool for it, so Swing Fool. Another cheesy reference. For you guys. <laughs> anyway, Mike, Gypsy, whatever I'm gonna call you, you're awesome. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank Absolutely. you for providing uh, value to the listeners, the watchers, and everything. We'll have to do it again. Till next time, see you guys. Awesome. Shit, that's Thanks awkward. <laughs> Till next time, see you guys.